here. So um, Acts chapter 11 and from verse 1, let's just once again pray. Lord, we thank you for the theme of redeeming love and the death of Christ. And we pray that now as we look to your word, once again, you would feed us the bread of life, speak to our souls and grant that your touch uh, would be upon that which is said tonight and your word, that would be the spirit of truth to our very souls this night. Amen. So uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 1. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come unto Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and did eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the manner from the beginning, the matter from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descended, as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me, upon the which, when I had fastened my eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air, and I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter kill and eat. But I said, no, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto my house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me, and the Spirit bade me go with them nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And it's that last verse that I'd like to speak on tonight, the, simple, the simplicity of the Christian gospel, which is who shall tell the words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And thank God that the burden that Christ lays upon us in order to go to heaven, which many people uh, describe as being saved, is very light and in many respects very simple. You might think I'm distorting truth to say, use those adjectives, but those are adjectives taken from the scripture itself to describe the way of salvation. You see, he doesn't lay upon us a burden which we're not able to bear in order to get to heaven. Otherwise, for that reason, there would be, for, it would be so, such a small number who would get there that no one could weigh up to that standard. And in fact, if it was a burden more than is, then I question whether any would be able to be saved. But Christ's burden is light, and he calls the broken, the weary, those who have no righteousness or strength of their own to come to him and to be salvation and to be saved. And this verse catches something of the simplicity of the way to heaven, which is only through our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall tell the words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Now, I'd like to speak very briefly tonight on this account that is given of the centurion at Caesarea. And it's a very remarkable incident that takes place in Acts chapter 10, and then it is recounted where I read tonight in Acts chapter 11, as it was a, a combination of miracles that took place all at the same time, for those who aren't familiar with it. First, there was the Jewish, uh, sorry, the Roman centurion, who was a godly man, who saw a vision of an angel, who told him, as we read tonight, go and call for Peter, Simon Peter, and he was told exactly where he was to come and speak to you. And exactly the right time, Peter was fasting and praying, and was praying, and the Lord gave him a vision, a threefold vision, and when it finished, the messengers from the centurion arrived at his house, having been sent by God to say, come to us. And Peter was left with absolutely no doubt. And the spirit also bade me go with them. He had this threefold witness multiplied several times to say, go 
and speak to this man and doubt not. You see, it was necessary because as we see, there was a contention at the time within the church. That was that the gospel was understood. Men and women were being saved and added to the numbers. But there was still some reluctance to say, but is the message really, is the church really also to be to the Gentile people? Uh, it, does Christ really want the gospel to go to all nations? And now we today, most of us would not be Jewish of, or uh, Messianic Jewish people who are Messianic believers, people who are once Jewish, people who believe on Christ. And we would take this for granted. We've benefited from it, haven't we, that the gospel has come to our lands, quite often facilitated by the Roman Empire, of which this story is set around. But at the time, there was a contention. And those of the, of the circumcision contended with Peter in verse 2 when they heard that he had been an eating with Romans, with, Jew, with Gentile Romans. They said, Peter, this is wrong. What were you doing? This is, this is not what you are to do. And this incident blew away any question in the church about is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for all nations and for all people? And the answer absolutely dogmatically, shown miraculously by God through his instance, is yes. And the reason I say this is not for some intellectual curiosity or historic interest. But the point is that this, that the gospel is for every person. Are you listening tonight and thinking, well, is there a place for me in Christ? Does he, is his will that I should be saved? The answer is yes, that he would have all men that is mankind, to be saved. If you are seeking Christ, that he turns none away. The trouble is that many do not seek after him, do not come to him. And if they would, they would be saved, but they do not. But if you wish, you may come to him. Now, I don't mean to tread on the toes of those who take a strong view about election and predestination, and perhaps we could debate that offline. But the point is that, the, that Christ's death can avail for me. And Christ would, without a doubt, have me, you, to be saved. So let's cleave to him in faith, knowing that it is his will that we are saved. Now, the centurion was a very good man. I would like to, uh, secondly, tonight, having to given that brief or longer introduction, depending on the perspective, talk about the insufficiency of his works. And it's interesting, isn't it? that the Peter is here preaching in Jerusalem, or sorry, explaining himself in Jerusalem to the church and recounting what happened. And he says that when he arrived at the house, the centurion told him in verse 14 of chapter 11, that he was told, who shall tell the words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. You see, the first um, or the second simple point I'd make to, like to make tonight is that the centurion was not saved if he had died before Peter had arrived to tell him those things, then if I may speak plainly, he would have gone to hell for everlasting hell. He was not saved at that point. And it therefore is something that behoves us to consider tonight, because what was it that made the difference? And he was a godly man. As I mentioned, the account is in chapter 10 and chapter 11 due to its significance. But we found that he's described in chapter 10 and verse 2 as a devout man and one that feared God with all his house. What are attributes this man had? And he wasn't devout to a Roman God. It seems that he was after the true God. He was a godly man. And also he feared God. And thirdly, all of his household did as well. And I'm guessing from this that it was a large household. As, a, as an officer of the Roman army with some significance, with his servants, his relatives, his family, his subordinates. They feared God and were devout as a consequence of his life and action. And I must say, I've read of one other soldier, and I, I know there will be many of others, who was a general during the Second World War. But people were profoundly influenced by what he said, absolutely, but also by his life. The godliness of this man had such an effect on them that they were convinced of the truth of Christ. 
And uh, you might say that this man was devout and his, his godly and devout life had such an effect also on his whole household. And in verse 30 of chapter 10, we find also that he fasted and he prayed. He, he was a generally not just a, a religious man, but he went about things in a very godly way. It says, uh, Cornelius said in verse 30, four days ago, I was fasting unto this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. You might think this man had everything. And in fact, he's told by the angel in verse 31 of chapter 10, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard and thine arms, that is his works of charity, his gifts and giving to the poor are had in remembrance in the sight of God. And we might think, what a man. And you might look at your lives and think, well, I'm nothing compared to this man. I haven't feared God. I've done nothing for the poor. I don't pray and fast. There is no hope for me. But look, but this man was not yet saved. He was in this state, but he was unsaved in the manner that he was. There was something that was still lacking. And, and the key point I'd like to make about is how that is provided by God. And before I move on to my third section tonight, uh, it reminds us of this scripture in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Absolutely unequivocal that no one, no man, no woman in all history or all, all time will be justified before the sight of God by the things that we have done. This man, despite all his godliness, his works were insufficient to get him into heaven, as the scripture says. But what was it that he needed? Well, he's told, send, get these men who will tell thee words whereby thy, thou and all thy house shall be saved. There was something that he needed to hear. And you, of course, know what this was. The message of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the account of Christ's death, resurrection, ascension, his coming again, that the fact that we can be right through God because God has reconciled the world to himself. What he needs to do is to hear these words and respond to them. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 18, the significance is, you see, that this message has been given to man. And he says in that verse, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And God, sorry, and hath committed unto us the message of reconciliation. And this is exactly the point. See, Cornelius was going about his own life to seek after God, but ignorance of the fact that Christ had reconciled the world, uh, God had reconciled the world to himself through Christ. And therefore, the only way for the centurion to be right with God was through Christ, because otherwise their trespasses would be imputed, a long word, but that would mean be, they would be held to account for their own sins. But God had put them on Christ, and therefore the way to be reconciled is only through Christ, and there's a need to be reconciled. And the reason why the words had to come from men is that the message of reconciliation, the, the account of how we can be right to God, has been given to man to be proclaimed. This is what he has appointed. As others have said, there was a bright, shining angel speaking to Cornelius. But that angel didn't preach Christ, did he? And instead, what did he do? He said, send for Simon Peter, and he will tell you. And brethren, it's so important for us to remember. You know, often we think, Lord, would you add souls? Would you please bring people in to the assembly, to our churches? Would you save people? And sometimes it's as if we're praying, Lord, would you send your angels to perform the preaching of the gospel that they might be saved? Brethren, we will see no salvation through that means because what does the scripture say? That God has committed unto us, the church, the message of reconciliation. It's through the foolishness of preaching that men are saved. That is through weak, frail men and women telling others of Christ, 
that God works and that he has appointed for salvation. And the centurion needed to hear this message of Christ. There was no salvation outside Christ. And his great need was that he would hear Christ preached. And finally, he, of course, needed to respond. And I will then touch on the evidence that he had been saved. You see, in Romans chapter 10, which I think is very, is very good, you see, it's not enough, is it, to hear the message of God. And I, I hope you know what I mean by that. You see, there was no doubt that God had spoken to Cornelius. I mean, he, he must have been in absolutely no doubt that what Peter was going to tell him was sent from God. And Peter equally had no doubt that he was sent of God to tell him. But despite that, if Cornelius, the centurion, had not responded, then he would not have been saved. And I trust you know what I mean. You see, it's not enough just simply to hear the gospel and nod our heads and say, that's, that's good, that's true, I agree, I agree it. But there's a requirement to respond. And in, in Romans 10, verse 8 to 9, he says, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And there's no doubt that that was the position that the centurion was in. He, he was hearing the word preached. God was speaking to him. But that, verse 9, there's a need for response. If thou should confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, if you will believe and take him as your Lord and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Isn't that so simple? That if you hear what God says of his son and confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved if you respond. And, and lo and behold, the centurion did. Because as he began to speak in verse 15 of chapter 11 of Acts, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit fell on them as at us at the beginning. See, he hadn't finished saying everything he intended to speak, to say, but he was, as it were, interrupted because at that point, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon those of the centurion and also those who were gathered to hear from his household. And Cornelius's band were saved as he was speaking. They received Christ into their hearts. And you see, sometimes salvation takes a long time as we search out and maybe Cornelius had been searching for many years. But once he started hearing the gospel, God stretched forth his hand and the man was saved and received Christ at that very hour. And isn't this the key to the work of evangelism? You see, God has committed to us the message, but the power of salvation, the work behind it to make people receive Christ is of God. And so as we by faith preach the gospel, it is God who works to witness and to save and to make his word grow. And in this case, produce seed a hundredfold. And who knows what happened, the effect of this when God was at work and when men followed him faithfully and preached the word. And the centurion, I guess, received then what he'd been longing for for many years, to the knowledge that he was saved, that he could, as it were, truthfully now rest in peace. He had found salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was witnessed by him receiving the spirit of God at that very moment. And what joy must have filled their hearts to know that their sins had gone, that their sins that they'd laboured unto had been forgiven. And I, and I think that it's fair to say that that was it, because he says, in verse 16, then I remember, this is Peter speaking, the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is I that I could withstand God? They knew that they'd been granted repentance and that they had received the Holy Spirit as evidence of salvation. And you might say, how can I to receive the same experience in the same manner. Well, isn't it just here? To hear those words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. 
to hear the message of Christ and believe on in our hearts, confess him with our lips, and then we will receive repentance uh, and forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit will be the seal in our hearts that we've been forgiven. And then we are able to work for Christ. That's what people could describe being born again. And then we will be useful for the Lord Jesus Christ. And is it thrilling that, yes, men did the work of God, but really it was God who was at work here. And perhaps I could illustrate this finally with one short anecdote. I was reading an account of, the, of some Moravian missionaries in the 18th century who were out in the Americas and preaching the gospel to some Indians. And uh, you see, salvation is a real experience, isn't it? It's not just an intellectual idea saying that, yes, I agree to it, but you, you receive Christ in your heart and you receive your spirit. This particular tribe of Indians had received several missionaries and they'd listen to them briefly and then dismiss them. But on one occasion, on the third occasion of missionaries going, it was a group of Moravians. And they had their failings like all of us, but these folks were real Christians, these particular individuals. And they preached to the Indians. Uh, and, uh, and then the, this real Christian then said to them all, I'm rather exhausted from my journey. I think I will take a sleep now. And he lay down on the spot in the middle of the American Indian enclave and fell asleep. And the Indians were bewildered. He lay down, they described, next to their bows and arrows and their spears that normally they would have used to murder white Westerners like them. But they saw this man fall asleep instantly, without a fear, sleeping as if he was in a feather down bed, absolutely assured. And they, they, they sat there and they watched him all night, discussed it. And they said, it must be true what he is telling us because he himself is utterly trusting in his God that he will deliver him. And consequently, when he woke up, I think it was the morning, when he woke up after a good sleep, they said to him, you may stay. We believe that the message you have is true and we wish to hear it. And from that, many were brought to Christ um, and were born again by the power of God's and you see, salvation is a real experience that those missionaries had received the spirit also. They knew that their, that their souls were now saved and that they were in Christ and they could sleep in the presence of their enemies and be safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if they weren't safe, they would go to be with the Lord. But they believed he had a purpose for them. And in that respect, they were utterly safe in that dangerous position. Well, we too can be saved from our sins. And the key is this in verse 14, who shall tell thee not works, but words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Amen. Well, I think we'll finish tonight with uh, a hymn that actually we sung this morning in church, but I'd already prepared it for tonight. So I don't think it matters that we sing it twice, but to God be the glory, great things he hath done. And let's sing of his works. Mm -hmm. 